company went public at 3.75 billion. Today it's sitting at 127. What happened to cause that? I would say it's a combination of the market is a bit of an abstract concept. A large part of it is just algorithms. When we get momentum, there's going to be people who will fully understand where we're heading. People love innovation and they're always willing to try and they love to figure out something that's going to do something new for them. I think the consumer is in a more delicate and fragile situation than people understand. It's going to be more difficult and there's going to be less spending than people think in the coming six months. When do you think you'll be profitable? Um... Joey, I am so excited for this. You know I've been an Allbirds fan for a long time. So thank you so much for joining me today. I've been a fan of your show and also just what you do in life and the platform to invest, the platform to uh, learn through you with uh, really interesting people. So I'm pretty delighted to be back on the show. Well, you are far too kind and flattery will get you everywhere, by mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to start with just the context, which is, you know, we see the incredible Allbirds brand today. What was the founding aha moment for you with Allbirds and you committing 10 years plus of your life to this business? I'll try to do justice to why Tim and I started this brand together uh, in a really brief time, but we come from very different backgrounds. So Tim Brown's my co-founder. He was a professional athlete, but he happened to have a design background. He's from New Zealand. He became the captain of the New Zealand national soccer team all the way through the 2010 World Cup. So obviously quite, quite good at his trade and was sponsored by the big sportswear companies during that time. And, and you know, just like most entrepreneurial journeys, it starts with, uh, with, with a moment where there's a problem out there that's not being solved for you individually. And he certainly had that and left wanting something. And it was around these gigantic logos on the side of his shoes. It was around the fact that the world had casualized and the footwear industry just really hadn't kept up with it. So he had this really unique and intuitive sense for the consumer, for the industry, and, and wanted to do something. He ended up throwing a Kickstarter up to like get it out of his system, frankly. And that was in 2014. I was one of the first customers of that Kickstarter because our wives happened to be uh, really close friends and were roommates in college. Uh, and as all good things happen in life, it's through the people who support you. Uh, and, and our wives are, are certainly uh, no, uh, no exception to that rule. At the time, though, what I was doing, I, I had caught the itch to use entrepreneurship for the benefit of the environment and, and the dynamic nature of the private sector in general, I knew could make a profound impact on the problem of our species, the existential threat that we all face. And um, that is more true today than it ever has been. And, and it certainly was in my mind back in, in 2016 when Tim and I launched Allbirds. With that itch, I took that and, and for the better part of a decade was working at a biotechnology company. It was called Solazyme. And we manipulated microalgae to eat low carbon intensity inputs. We used, we used the waste streams from sugarcane processing. And we would, through that manipulation of the microalgae, we would enable this, this microbe to multiply and grow and produce any kind of replacement for petroleum. And so I led the petrochemical replacement area, which was kind of green chemicals, uh, and, and would go out and talk to brands around the world, talk to other businesses about the idea that you could replace what you use today, have a higher performance and no carbon impact on the world. And it was like breathtaking, like, yes, of course we want that. And then all of a sudden it was three conversations later. It's like, you know what? We actually just need margin. Can you make this plastic stuff just and make it cheaper? And so it was a Sisyphean exercise for me where I, I realized that while the technology existed, the consumers wanted it. It was it, this no compromise offering was there for the taking and brands could not position it correctly. And so Tim and I came together and saw that one plus one could equal three. We could blend his his design and instinctual uh, sense for the consumer with with my material science background and, and experience in entrepreneurship. And we decided that this was a worthwhile endeavor for leadership, for business and, and for a legacy that we thought our, our grandkids would be proud of. I mean, you intellectual savant dropping a Sisyph Sisyphean, which Sisyphus for people listening is the kind of the, the idea of pushing a rock continuously up a hill really and going uh, not very far. Uh, <laughs> but I love that in terms of dropping that in, in the intro. Incredible. Um, listen, I said that we'd just be direct. Dude, the brand is amazing. Yeah, everyone loves the brand and it's a very well-known brand. Obviously, company went public 
uh, went out at 3.75 billion. Today it's sitting at 127 million. And, and that, I think we chatted before and it was like, that's the same almost kind of give or take as a Series A. Can I ask a really stupid question, but just educate me. What happened to cause that? Well, there, you know, there's, I would say it's a combination of exogenous factors uh, and, and then there are some controllables as well that we, we didn't do as well as we should have uh, on the same token. You know, I take responsibility for all of that because regardless of what happens in the external environment, you need to be prepared to, to, to grab it. Now, I'll just say valuation is something that I don't control. Um, all we can control is, is how strong the business results are. And, you know, we had oriented the business around, um, a significant growth. And, you know, in the early days of, of Allbirds, we started in 2016 and up until, uh, the pandemic happened in early 2020, we were growing exceptionally high rates and started making investments to continue to capitalize on that. When the pandemic happened, we were in a, a, a position where, uh, we were not set up for what was to come over the next two to three years. And I think those, those factors, uh, that, that happened from, uh, what the consumer was doing, how fast they were changing in terms of, uh, the direction of what they wanted from different brands and the fact that they gravitated to brands who had incredibly high awareness and had been around for a long time contributed very significantly to uh, a situation where it was difficult to parse the signal from the noise for us. In that uh, chapter of the company, uh, we made some fantastic decisions. Uh, and then we also made some decisions that were, that were not as good. And, and the external environment also was super tough. And so along the way, we, we continued to believe that the, the brand was a billion dollar brand and the business just needed to do some catching up. Uh, and we wanted to further capitalize the business and make sure that we could control our own destiny, could, uh, capture the vision that we, we believe. And, you know, how you started that question is really important. The brand foundation is incredibly strong. And we see this every day whenever we do consumer insights work. And we do that a, a lot and quite regularly being a consumer insight, being a consumer driven business. The health of the brand is incredible. So we now have a brand that's, you know, close to $300 million in revenue. Uh, we have recognition within a really interesting group of consumer, albeit we still have less than 15% aided brand awareness, meaning only 15% of the U.S. Uh, population knows that all birds exist. And we know that when people try our products, they love it and they come back. One of the biggest issues for us is just making sure a lot more people find out about us and we say, uh, say a nice hello. So we have them fall in love and we'll be well back on the journey for, for having that business catch up to the promise of this brand. Joey, I know you, you're an incredibly thoughtful and reflective person. When you are reflective and you think back on the internal, external is freaking hard. <laughs> like In this world, you know, you can't take credit for the external, uh, internal elements that you made mistakes on. What do you think of the core one or two? Yeah. And, and, you know, look, when, when, when the externals are good, I, I won't take credit for that either. And, and, and I think there are some things in 2016 that we saw, we identified and we, we capitalized on those opportunities that were real tailwinds for us. And, and frankly, I see, uh, some of those tailwinds coming back with incredible vigor now. And, and I think if you think about what's happened from, uh, over the last couple of years with this like maximal build in the trend of, of, of how shoe companies have been coming to the consumer marketplace. And, and the fact that now quiet luxury is really coming back and people really want to celebrate this, um, almost anonymous luxury with this very elevated premium experience. That's something that is, uh, that is going to be a tailwind for us in the coming years. And, and I'm pretty excited about that. But again, I won't take credit for it. We'll just try to capitalize on the opportunity that we see. But, you know, if I look back, um, um, uh, on the on the things that we can control, there's tactical decisions in the business, whether it's specific products or inventory buys or things like that. Those are all really, really important. Was the move into running an athletics a good decision? Because my my, my my take as a consumer was like, no, 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 you're like a, a great luxury leisure brand. Mm. I go to Nike for my running. No mm. offense. You can't change the perception of a brand overnight. That's for sure. What we have found over the over the course of, of of the last year, in particular, in terms of how we position to the consumer and what we stand for, and the role that we can play in their lives to best serve how they see our brand and and how they see our products, is in this like active life area. 
and and I've talked about this quite extensively um, externally, and that's it's it's this crossover place between an informal and casual lifestyle with an active health and well being oriented existence in in life. And our shoes deliver something with versatility of style and incredible outsized comfort that's perfect for that. And so that is the core of where we started the brand, and that's where we're we're gonna bring everything back to with a really sharp clarity for the consumer and and the potential when we do that is going to be pretty significant so I, I think in, in in part you're 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 very right about that and where we where we should live into the future so you thought maybe product expansion or lack of was one mistake is, is that it in some respects but to, to answer your question directly I, I think all of the success that we've had and all of the stumbles that we've had it, it always comes back to people and and the entrepreneurial journey as a leader you know we're a very small company and we've started eight less than eight years ago and along that journey the balance of who you select this balance of entrepreneurship and uh ambition and and thinking that you can reshape uh, a little bit of the world the little segment that you exist in as a brand in a way that can can match a future that's different than what we see today that's an important element. There's also an incredibly important element around bringing in people with a sharp expertise around the functions and the industry expertise that's required to be excellent at all of the fundamentals. I often talk about uh, with, with our leaders that what they bring in is deeply needed and deeply respected, but we need to think about it as a reference book, not a playbook. And what we're doing is slightly different. We have different contours of, of distribution than the rest of the industry. We have a different position positioning that's ever existed in, in the sneaker world. And so it needs to be a reference book. And sometimes we've gotten that right Sometimes we've gotten that wrong in terms of, of, of the people that we've had. And, and, um, they're all almost to a person, incredible people, incredibly high integrity people. But there's a right time and a right place for each of these leaders to, to exist in a business to help us be extremely effective. And honestly, it boils down to that, both the successes and, and, and the failures along the way. Do you regret going public? No, I don't. Um, you know, we have, we have a mountain of cash. We have control of our destiny and the fact that Wall Street's written us off uh, as a fickle beast as it is, the markets are, are unforgiving and our market cap is a, is a uh, reflection of the fact that we've essentially been written off by people. And until we start delivering quarter over quarter incredible financials that, that trend towards and then eventually meet our long term targets for how this business is structured, we will suffer in that space. And, and so our, our job as a company is to urgently march towards that, uh, with all the sharp insights that we, we have and, and drive towards that. And when we do, the market will come back and come behind us. So, you know, it's a matter of time frame that you think about these things through and uh, a, a couple of years of re-shifting on what we need to do for the right long-term thing for the business will pay off for anyone who wants to jump on board now or, or in, the, in the near future. Do you consider yourself a fashion company or a technology company? Because for years it was kind of, as you put it in the technology bucket, are you a fashion company or a tech company, do you think? We are a product company first and foremost. And we need to tell amazing stories around those products. That That is what we are. And we happen to exist in a category where style and fashion is incredibly important. That That is how I think about the company. Now, we have developed an incredible set of data and technological infrastructure that is at the bleeding edge of of how companies in our space exist and we need to leverage that in a in a wonderful way to be eventually as successful as we need to and that comes back to consumer insights even just listening to our consumers and how we come to market and how we then uh iterate that feedback back into the product life cycle that is incredibly important and something that we have uh uh, in spades relative to our, our competition, no matter what their size, even if they're uh, many, many billion dollars in size, we have, uh, we, we are uh, leading in terms of the infrastructure and the tech enablement that we've been able to bring into the business. What do you think is the biggest difference between being public and being private, Joey? Everyone's seeing everything you're doing every single day. And, you know, businesses don't 
uh, don't happen on quarterly cycles, but financial reporting and public markets do. And so, you, you know, you do have to face the reality that uh, every single thing that you're doing from from that point when you become a public company into the future is exposed for all to see the good and the bad. That's a, a stark difference from when you're a private company, when uh, you can do uh, you can make certain decisions that that um, have zero implication uh, because you happen to be uh, reporting at that specific quarter. And and in this case, it's not. And so in some ways, the discipline is excellent. It forces you to have a cadence that is um, driving urgency towards the business. And in some cases, it could be a little bit in tension with the long term build of the business. But we've tried to structure things in a way, um, both from a governance perspective and from a capitalization perspective that allow us to be uh, really good stewards of any investor who uh, has belief in the brand for the long term and sees the the potential of of what we've created from the early days and now just need to execute on on the business side to bring it uh, bring those bring those two things in convergence. You said about Wall Street writing you off. Does that anger you? Like I'd be pissed off that so like, if someone writes me off, I'm like I'm I'm annoyed. It's humbling, no doubt. Uh, you know when you when you uh, we went public at fifteen dollars a share and now we're at like a dollar. Dropping more than 90% of the value for shareholders that you orient the success of your business around. Um, and I take that responsibility incredibly seriously, uh, as does everyone at our company. Up and down from the, uh, the person who just started yesterday on the, on the planning team to our board members, um, and including myself. That is of, of our utmost concern. And so when we don't deliver for, for those people... Um, that is that is a humbling experience, and you know, there's a lot that happened in the capital markets when interest rates went up significantly. That was unavoidable for us to expect that everything would be exactly the same. However, uh, it doesn't absolve any of the responsibility that I feel to drive the shareholder value that we create. And so, I'm not annoyed. I'm not angry. Uh, I'm I'm emboldened to uh, make sure that we get it back and deliver much more than uh, when we came out. I, like I've always en- envisioned that the IPO price that we came out with was a good starting point and that people that invested alongside us uh, at the IPO would make lots of money in the fullness of time. You know, given the way things have changed, uh, they're going to need to hang on for a couple of years right now. And and as we as we do that, um, and, and, and as we execute, I think the, the future can be incredibly bright. I think a lot of people honestly say it's like, ah, oh, this is case that D to C doesn't really make sense and that actually like eh, kind of undifferentiated products and actually it's just bad unit economics. To what extent do you say, no, you don't get it at all? Yeah, that I, I mean, I think that that characterization being lumped into a, a, a group of companies that's called the DTC group of companies. That, Does that, that piss you off? Yeah. It, I just think it's a generalization that lacks any kind of understanding of what we do. And so you, you, we're a brand. We're not a channel. DTC is a way to do business. There's been great retailers who started this in our industry. If you broaden it beyond footwear into apparel, like The Gap in the 90s. And Lululemon has done a really wonderful job of being a great DTC company. But they're a product first company. They happen to use a DTC channel to reach consumers. Um, and that's what we envisioned was the best way to start our journey. We are a brand first and we've always envisioned that omni-channel operation where we reach consumers where they want to shop is the right way to structure the business. However, you got to start building a deep fan base and a deep loyalty and a love between your company and the consumer. And the best way for us to do that was was through uh, an incredibly immersive and wonderful store experience and a great digital ecosystem and shopping experience for them to enjoy our products with. And we've become a great retailer uh, in the process of doing that. And as we brought in now into um, into the wholesale marketplace in the US and eventually in, in the international geos that we serve, we're going to grow awareness. We're going to reach a lot more consumers and they're going to fall in love just like the early early groups of, of, of consumers who we reached um through that direct through that direct approach and so there are businesses out there that I'm well aware of that take a commodity product and try to cut the middleman out and reach the consumer directly and that is the business model but as i said we're a product company where we make magical product we do it through a deep r&d process where we focus on naturally derived or bio-based products that can create differentiated and positive consumer experiences that no one else has produced 
and consumers never get tired of innovation. While a shoe you might think of as a commodity marketplace or, or a commodity that you just need to have, it's a utility that you need to have. It is so uncommoditized within the space that we play and we are so differentiated. And, and when we, when we are at our best, we offer something to the consumer that, uh, they haven't experienced before and they love. And I know you're one of those, Harry. So, um, so that's, can, can, can I be direct then and just actually kind of press you and say, do you think you do a good product marketing job then? Because if we think I, I, I agree with you, I don't think she's a commoditized the tool, but I think, oh, I'm sorry, this might be a real trigger, but I think on actually market the technology very well the scientific approach to the bubbles and the shoes that also visibly like scientific because it stands out you can see it very do you think you product market the innovation well uh when we're at our best i think we've done wonderfully if you think about like there's some intuitive cues i think is what you're pointing to that that suggests that it delivers something uh, of benefit to the consumer that's tangible and I think when you, when you look at the materials that we've selected, these are premium, uh, n like nature derived, uh, materials and textiles that give you this tangible luxury that you feel when you slip it on your foot. And, and I think if anyone is listening here has, has tried on a pair of all birds, you know, it, it just feels a little bit different than any other shoe you've ever put on. And, and that feeling is signaled through the materials that we have and, and the intuitive de design language that we've delivered through, uh, the whole suite of our products. There's been moments in time, particularly in recent times, uh, if you think at the start of the pandemic, where companies who were focused on athletic performance positioning in a moment when people who hadn't run in 15 years decided they needed to buy another pair of running shoes for the first time. And those companies often had, uh, because the whole industry is structured like this before we started, was you know 70, sometimes 80% wholesale uh, distributed, there's a lot of touch points for the consumers to um, connect with that brand. And in a moment when everything got shut down, that was an incredible asset for for a lot of companies. And so you can see that there's there's um, very significant momentum created by some of those external factors. And and some companies did really good job of of. Uh, grabbing onto that momentum and and continuing to execute well. Others didn't do as good of a job of that. And I think we were in the unfortunate position of not being structured in a way that that could capitalize exactly on the the dramatic change that had happened in that world. But we're we're getting back to a little bit more normalcy here. What would have allowed you to capitalize on it? Well, I, I mean we we didn't have an athletic positioning um at all at that time. And, you know, we were a hundred percent of a casual lifestyle shoe offering in 2019. Uh, we launched our first, uh, I would call it like light active shoe in the Dasher in 2020, which was really fortunate because that, that did capture um, some of the zeitgeist of what had happened. That's one really important element where, where that was just a moment where you can look at the athletic sneaker market and it just absolutely surged during that, that time period. That's okay. We didn't need to be um, a big part of that. And, and as I said, I think that the next five years are going to be shaped by something quite quite distinct from that, which is uh, exciting for me. The second element is, you know, we we had um, I remember in, my, in the Series A uh, fundraising deck that we put together, we had this map of by year uh, w what channel we wanted to reach consumers through and which segments of the consumer population we would be reaching via those channels. And along the journey there, we expected that we would start to uh, expand our product assortment and be able to put these products into the right, into the right channels and reach the right consumers with those, uh, with that, with that connection point. That slide, as it said, was, you know, we would start with a digital ecosystem, add stores starting in 2017, and then branch out to wholesale, uh, when you get to 2020. 2020, uh, we, we kind of hit the pause button on that because of everything that was going on. And now we're kind of back on that journey. And, and, and that omni-channel vision is the right vision. And, and as I said, we're a brand, not a channel. And so it's important to reach consumers profitably wherever they need to be, uh, wherever they prefer to shop. Had we uh, been in a situation where we had a bunch more wholesale distribution, we had elevated awareness through that, that expansion of channel. I think when people shut down and started looking for a product that they were familiar with and knew the brand, they would have um, had, had much more opportunity to discover our brand and and then eventually see the the f delightful experience that our products deliver we're in a new world where people are leaner than ever and kind of questioning large fundraisings when you look back 
Do you feel that you needed all the money you raised or do you wish you'd gone lighter on fundraising? The way I looked at these fundraisings at every step of the journey, and, and I looked at my own role along the same uh, paradigm that I'll explain here, is that you set out a set of expectations to a group of people that you you say, I need this money, I'm going to invest it here, and it's going to generate these outcomes and these milestones. And then you take the money and you go deliver. And we had an incredible history of success of wildly out delivering the expectations that we set when we took money. And then in the process of, of delivering on those expectations, you start to say, okay, can we move the goalposts a little further? Do we think that the brand potential and the ambition of what we have requires us to continue to deepen the investment? And when we took extra money, it was because the answer to that was yes, in our view. And we thought we had both the um, capabilities and and the strategy uh, and the and that profound connection with a group of consumers that uh, in a very large marketplace that would suggest that, yes, this investment is important to make if we're going to eventually capture the potential of this brand. And, and so that's when we took the money. Looking back, um, I could quibble on a detail here or there on, on, on a fundraise in terms of the exact amount of money, but that was never important to me. It was about creating something really special, a multi-generational brand that withstood the test of time and redefined how consumer products and consumption could actually be, be done, not just in the footwear industry, but much more broadly. And I think we're well on track to do that. Um, and, and, and yet business is never a straight line up and to the right. It's pretty squiggly. And so that's, uh, that's the fun of it. Dude, I, uh, I heard that actually some of your investors at the Series A were like, not forced, but kind of ushered to sell then. Was that true? And how did that happen? In the Series A? Yeah. We've, I've never told someone to sell or not sell. Um, I, I'm, I'm always fine if they want to. Um, <laughs> but but um, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you're referencing. Terrible, terrible references that people give us, clearly. Can I ask, did you have acquisition offers along the way? I think often a lot of founders hear shows and they don't actually hear this side. Did you ever have acquisition offers? You never know if an acquisition offer is a real acquisition offer until the piece of paper is in front of you and you have the opportunity to sign it. And so nothing ever got to that point. Um, but we've had we've had a number of companies um, in the footwear space and in the kind of ecosystem of of apparel and footwear more broadly come to us and and ask us if we are interested in selling it's nothing i'm ideologically opposed to same for tim um we want to we want to achieve the multi-generational brand potential that we've we've created in the early years and if that's best done with a partner that's something we would consider and if it's best done independently um then we'll take that path and so far it's been it's been the latter can I ask a really unfair question please at this market cap are you not like, fuck it, Tim, let's take this private again? Nothing ideologically opposed, private or public. I think we have everything we need right now the, 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 uh, to, to control our destiny and to do everything we believe we need to do to um, build an incredible, incredible business and an incredible brand. If along that journey, uh, the, the public markets don't see the value that we're creating... And there's a, a big gap between the value that we are creating and and what the enterprise value is of the company. Then I think it's it's prudent to consider all options. And and we have a board that does their duty quite responsibly to make sure we're thinking about all the options all the time. And and when we see a huge gap between between that for a very prolonged period of time, then it's it's something that has to be considered. I'm really just going for it, but we know we can edit it out if we need to. So fuck it. It's a Friday evening. You can't see, but it's actually dark here. Uh, <laughs> did you did, did you manage to take any secondaries off the table? A lot of founders did in the last few years, and I think it's very helpful often to realize upside to have the relief of financial pressure did you manage to i think how you just framed that's really important i mean like if i could um guide anyone on, on this topic um w which i wouldn't say i've i've done perfectly i can understand the life you want to live first and and if you uh if you really want to um live a, a life of of material luxury you should try to sell things as quickly as possible at as high a price as possible um, if you're interested in making sure that you can uh, have financial security for yourself and your family, that more than that, 
is not going to be particularly useful to you. Like the diminishing return on that extra dollar is quite, quite significant. That kind of camp and that thinking is how my wife and myself uh, sort of oriented ourselves around this business and the financial potential that it would create. I like to give our shareholders the opportunity to make their own decisions on that. If they want to sell at any point in time, um, they should be able to. And I think it's fair for me to have that opportunity as well, of course. Um, but everything now that we're public is, um, is quite out there. So uh, I've sold extraordinarily little at the IPO. I sold nothing. And then after that, um, I've sold incredibly little. And frankly, it's just really to meet that, that bottom of the, of the Maslow's for me. And, and some might, some might judge the amount differently, but it's not much. So, uh, and, 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 and particularly in the place we live. So, um, I, I feel very financially secure and in a place that's great for myself and my family. And in the future, if there's more, that's, uh, that's wonderful too. And I can say that, uh, it doesn't take anything away from my uh, focus on creating as much value as we can, because I know that I can do great things with extra money, even if I don't need to spend it on a nice car. Judging by my mother's appetite for Chanel, I think she'd have a preference for me selling every single thing <laughs> that I own now, to be quite honest with you, Joey. Um, so <laughs> No judgment one way or another. Just understand what you, what you, what you want in life. I think, honestly, dude, like I look it back at some hard things that I've been through and they shape me a lot. Um, that's why I look so much older than I am. I'm still actually 14. How have you changed as a leader over what is a tough time given market performance? Yeah. You know, the last couple of years have been, I probably got more growth in wisdom in a short period of time than I've gotten the whole uh, rest of my life. And a lot of that comes into leadership. And, and you know, victory has a thousand fathers and failure has only one so uh, as the saying goes and and so you know making sure that um there's a constant uh, a constant self awareness that there's discipline in the good times and the bad times that there's an even killed nature across that approach to leadership and that you're authentically trying to get the best out of everyone around you and and making sure that the leaders that are coming along for the journey uh, have that same dedication, resilience, and work ethic that you do, and also that same discipline to do things right, both when things are going great and when things are going not great. That is something where we hadn't been tested so much in terms of um, when things weren't going great prior to this period. And and we've pulled back on a bunch of investments in the business. And as a result, the sales have declined this year for the first time in the history of, of the company. What did you pull back on, if you don't mind me asking? Lots of things. I mean, we, we pulled back on distribution. So really it's like product and distribution in our business. And then there's marketing. We got too fat with inventory. So we needed to pull, like clean that up. So this year has, that's been the number one priority for, for our business this year is honestly from a financial perspective, at least is cleaning up inventory along the way. We got to, um, refresh the product, improve it significantly to get back to that really active core that you, that you referenced earlier. And in the process of doing that, we wanted to pull back on distribution. So we stopped all store growth. We pulled back on some of the wholesale expansion and we then pulled back probably, I don't know exactly the exact number, but high teens marketing. Um, in terms of uh, year over year comparisons on the dollars we spent, so all of that has been pulled back, and as a result of that, of course, like you're you're likely to see um, sales decline. But that that's actually well part of the plan for us. And when we come through this year, which is quite transitional, we'll have a very healthy and clean inventory. Uh, we will be poised to. Uh, lean into the products that we come to market with and the innovation that we come come with and and that we can bring joy around those products through the marketing we do uh, and and that's that's a recipe for a really nice rejuvenated and renaissance for the brand which i'm I'm pretty excited about to what extent do you think Wall Street has a flexible mind? I know that seems strange, but sometimes you see irrationality in the minds of Wall Street where it's like the decisions made. The market is a bit of an abstract concept. Um, they're actually a large part of it is just algorithms, and then there's real people on the on the real buyers of it. And when we get momentum um, from a business perspective and a brand perspective, there's going to be people who 
will fully understand where we're heading and will see the transformative aspect of what we've done, particularly in the last 12 months and how that will translate to incredible value in the future years. And they'll get on board. Equally, there's going to be doubters that will say, I don't believe it and, and that it's not going to work out. And, and, and maybe it was a fad, whatever, whatever the reason is, there's always going to be doubters and there always has, but that's a market, you know, and that, that's, that's how it is. And then it, 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 like, like we've done, um, historically and like I, I expect we'll continue to do, we're going to put up expectations and then wildly over deliver on them. That's the, that's the ambition for any, any person running a company. That's my full expectation of what we should go out and, and do. And that typically silences the doubters. I had Jen from uh, Rent the Runway on and she really nailed home the drive towards profitability. That was something that she really echoed time and time again. When do you think you'll be profitable? What we've said to the market, and we've got to be pretty consistent with that uh, on your podcast as well, uh, is is that we'll be cash flow and EBITDA profitable in uh, 2025. So just so everyone understands that listening... What's the alternative to cash flow and EBITDA profitable? I'll take a bit out, but like, what does that actually mean? Does that mean profitable? I'm I'm naive here. Even those are I, the best metrics to judge profitability um, in terms of how a business should be valued in our space. So anything we make in the future from a cash flow perspective is you know discounted back to today's dollars is the value of our company, and so those are the best metrics to um, to look at to gauge uh, what the value of our enterprise should be. Got you. Okay, that makes sense. Guys, on retail, it's a fucking beast. What do you know now that you wish you'd known when you started the retail strategy? Being a good retailer is hard, um, no doubt. And uh, But I think we've proven that we can create a really wonderful retail experience. I, I would say some of the things that were difficult to see, but, you know, particularly sometimes you sign leases a year ahead of when you actually open up a store, is the changing patterns of consumers um, over the last two, three years. And it's not only um, what they wanted to consume, but where they were buying things has changed really significantly. In the wake of so much uncertainty, um, you know, we, we, we had shaped some perspective around the fact that things would get back to the way they were. And I think they are getting back to the way they were. And <laughs> I actually think that's true. Just the time horizon that that's, um, that that's taking people to kind of regain a semblance of, of their former lives. And some things are lost forever. So. When you say we get back to the way they were, you mean like shopping in stores, that physical experience, you thought it would happen quicker than it has? Well, there's a whole bunch of factors to that. You know, it's it's like, think about the urban environments that historically people have worked in. And now it's, you know, in San Francisco, it's three days a week in the office. If you're, if you're at a, a, a company who's like draconian in the sense of, of, of thinking that working together in a physical space is a good idea. And some are completely remote that used to be, have a physical office presence. And so people are consumers. Those employees are commuting into work. They're in the restaurants, they're walking around the city, uh, and they're shopping in those areas after work or, or whatnot. And so that is the, um, that, that is things that have changed. All my companies, five days a week. Yeah. We're back to old times. We do work together. That's not happening in San Francisco quite yet, I would say. Um, and I'm not suggesting that that's the way of the future, but I do think um, there is a... Um, people talk about productivity. The conception of what productivity means is far too narrow, and particularly in an industry like mine, where creativity and physical products are central to what we do. That not being together is... Uh, is impossible. And so that that's the way that we've thought about them coming back. And and most of the people who are closest to the the central aspects of of product creation and and design and marketing are are coming in uh uh for four days a week. And we've done some other things with some of the more um adjacent functions beyond that. But speaking of like being together, you know, I I really like and respect you, Joe. You, know, you did the show years ago when you really didn't need to, and I always remember your kindness. I hope it's okay for me to ask, but like, have you had any semblance of balance at all over the last year or so since going public? But I think I think people don't actually have enough humanity for the torrid time that it can have on a person. I don't think balance is the right word. <laughs> um, because for the last decade, or, or frankly, more than that, if when I was at my previous jobs, I, I, I'd like, I just think about what I do. If I'm, if I'm going to pour the majority of my like waking life to something, like it's got to be super meaningful. And the only way that I, I, I can do this is to 
two things. I really try to integrate my uh, family into the work. And I really involve uh, in a way that's quite meaningful to me. You know, my, my my wife, her name is Liz. She's a behind the scenes hero to the company. And I don't just say because she supports me or whatever, which is true. It's because of the insights that she's brought to the business and um, the help that she does in thinking through problems with me. And and that, uh, you know, I think she gets some some joy out of, out of being a part of that. And that helps um, bring my personal life into my business life. And so that that's one aspect of it. The second thing is my kids don't give a shit what I do. They, uh, you know, when they were little, it was like um, chief executive one one hour, and the next I was like chief butt wiper the next. So they don't they don't care, right? And they still don't care. They're older now, but um, but they did they just want to be with me and be and, and have a great time. And so what I try to do is just be present for the kids, um, not touch my phone uh, for a large portion of the time that I'm with them, and certainly the the, the beginnings every time I come home from work. And when I'm at work, I try to focus and prioritize that. So those are the two elements. And now what's overlaid over the last two years has been a layer of anxiety and stress that has um, been much more than than previous in my life. And so that's different than balance. That's that's something that, you know, every person, including myself, just need to figure out a way to um, to deal with so that you can have that focus when you're when you're when you're prioritizing one or the other. How has how you deal with stress changed? I remember some of my hardest times showed me the pits of how bad times can be and how I deal with stress today is I remember those to pers- gain perspective as to how bad it could be. In the last two years, I would say probably the biggest change has been um, the reliance on the team that I work with a little bit um, differently. Having a focus on giving room for myself included to really express what people are thinking and what those anxieties are in a room very regularly uh, with those people who are on the team has been not just cathartic, but also really helpful because some of those anxieties are grounded in in reality. Like you should be anxious about this. Like there's something not going well. Like why are you losing sleep about this? So I'd say that's, that's one element and the other stuff of, of um, fitness and stuff like that, that I need to do and hobbies on the side that I need to do just to keep myself sane. Like that's been pretty consistent. Are you anxious about the macro ahead? And I know that sounds like a very kind of big and shit meta question, but it obviously has a knock on effect on, on luxury, on retail, you know, LVMH mm-hmm. posted not so great numbers for the first time, almost in my fucking memory. And when did LVMH not post good numbers? Jesus, then we are in trouble. Um, but does that worry you? No, the consumer is in a more delicate and fragile situation than people understand. Mm-hmm. And that it's going to be, more difficult and there's going to be less spending than people think in the coming six months. But that's just a reality. That's my belief. And so we're structuring the business around that belief. Um, and, and that means a little bit more conservatism and investment and playing offense in the areas that we think we can really generate value for, for the, for the people, for, for, for our business. If your question is, do I think that there's weakness ahead? Yes. If I am anxious about that, the answer is no. And anyone who has that belief, I would hope that they're doing something about it (laughs) to structure their business in a way to be extremely resilient within that framework, Uh, because there's going to be cycles up and down and and it's, it's how you structure and respond to those that, that, um, that create the value or not. A consumer's loyal. I had this debate at dinner with my girlfriend last night and I said, uh, sorry, uh, running shoe wise, I'm Nike. I don't wear anything else. I'm Nike. I have been for years. And she's like, no, no, no. Like, actually, you do this, this. Are consumers loyal or not when it comes to shoes? Yeah. I mean, I think, look, the the average American consumer buys eight pairs of shoes a year. That's men, woman, and child. And, and so that's about two and a half billion pairs of shoes sold every year. There's a bunch of very specific uses within a person's closet that they're looking for a shoe to deliver. And then there's um, uh, probably a little bit more uh, broader based uh, opportunities. And within certain areas of the closet, I'd say there's um, there's there's varying degrees of loyalty and there's always an open mindedness to try. Like the, the, the amazing thing about in, in the U.S. in particular, this is true. 
like people love innovation and they're always willing to try and they love to be, uh, to figure out something that's going to do something new for them. And so there's always, always some willingness to, to try. Um, that said, I think once you build a really deep connection with a consumer, um, they are incredibly loyal. And how does that translate in terms of business and purchase frequency? Different for every business, but we found incredible love from our consumers and, and, um, we try to respect that deeply with very transparent communication and listening to their feedback and building that into the products as quickly as we can. Final one, I promise then we'll do a quick fire, but you see on really hard now pushing to expand wallet and expand spend with clothes, with accessories. How do we expand spend beyond shoes with all birds? There's gonna be natural extensions for us to go. Um, you know, look, I'm wearing um, the best t-shirt in the entire world right now. And Love it's that a, little massaging of the chest it, there, yeah. Jerry. It's an all birds, um, it's an all birds anytime soft merino tee. Um, it's 45 bucks. It's a ridiculous value. And it's, uh, it is the best t-shirt in the marketplace. I'm wearing a sun spell, which is $200. <laughs> uh, man, we will out deliver that any day. So, uh, yeah, give it, give us a try. Um, but so, so I think there's, there's natural extensions. Look, what we're, what we're best at is looking in places for consumer experiences from natural fibers and natural materials that no one else is looking for those opportunities. And when we see something that speaks to the lifestyle of what we're creating with shoes, we can have an opportunity to extend that comfort and that, and that, uh, and that aesthetic and that just tangible luxury feel. This is a great example of that. And it doesn't need to be huge. It doesn't need to be big categories because, you know, as I said, People buy in the U.S. eight pairs of shoes a year. In, in the U.K., it's, it's probably the same. The market is absolutely enormous. And if we just get really good, really, really good at just a few shoes, we can be a billion dollars in sales and go well beyond that. And so it's just sharpening the focus and being clear for the consumer and not getting tired of, your, of, the, of the story that you're telling to consumers before they do, which... It takes a long time for consumers to get tired. It's much quicker for employees to get tired. So just remembering that and keeping a focus on that very sharply is is what brings us to the promised land and what we're working on today. So totally, uh, employees get tired much quicker than consumers for sure. I always say, as a leader, when you get bored of telling the story and the mission, you're just starting. Mm. Like it should be boring. You That's need right. to embrace that. That's right. Yeah. Um, I want to do a quick fire round. So I say a short statement. You give me your immediate thoughts. What do others not know that you know to be true, Joey? There's a survey that goes out um, from a couple of different companies. Every single survey that comes back about social issues that consumers care about, environments number one, across almost every single one with the exception of like blips in time when something major happens in the world. So for a six month period, maybe it's that one. But at the same time, they go out and buy a $3.78 polyester t-shirt or sweater from Shein and have no connection between their value orientation around what matters and what they consume. So this say do gap as, as it would be referred to is pretty vast at the moment. I do think that that will close. And when that closes, um, the companies who are positioned where they're delivering excellence on every dimension that the consumer wants from the product outside of sustainability, but also delivering um, on that promise around alignment with their values, those are going to be the biggest companies of the next generation. And that's what we're trying to build. So there'll be more skeptics than not skeptics on that perspective. Uh, however, I think that's the great unlock for the next great generation of brands. You can be CEO of any other company for a day. Which would you be CEO of? Interesting question. You should have sent me these in advance. Or maybe I should have just listened to your other podcast recently to know exactly what you would have asked me. I'd say one of the most interesting companies out there are the ones leading um, the new large language models and AI technology like OpenAI. But I don't think I would want to bear that burden of responsibility for humanity. So I'll, I'll eliminate those. I'd say a company that that is um, done a really nice job in an area that I take a lot of inspiration from would probably be Tesla, which is around performance and quality of a product and an aesthetic and a beauty that delivers in and of itself. And the free gift with purchase is that it's much more sustainable for the planet. And that's kind of what I aspire for all birds. So that'd be a pretty fun one. You can have dinner with anyone dead or alive. Nelson Mandela. Why, why Nelson above anyone? Pretty long journey in prison. 
and the resilience and the long-term view that he had and the actual uh, tenacity to take a, uh, a whole country and shape that around the vision that he had uh, with determination and unrelenting, unrelenting focus on what that future could be with fairly uh, thoughtful and nonviolent outcomes that you might be tempted by in the short term, uh, but would jeopardize the long term. Uh, that's a guy that we can all learn a lot from. What's your favorite brand and why them? Other than all birds, obviously. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I kind of like Traeger. What a Traeger. I didn't even know Traeger. It's a, it's a smoker. It delivers incredible flavor to all the food we cook and takes the magic out of barbecue and allows uh, a lot more people to make phenomenal food that people can enjoy without uh, the intimidation of an open flame. <laughs> i'm not a cook so uh, i'm i'm uh clearly they have some brand awareness to do or maybe i just need to actually leave a room once in a while <laughs> um joey final one for you 10 years time it's 2033 where are you then what i think about most is um where where all birds is gonna be um we wrote a vision in 2016 and we we situated ourselves uh in the summer of 2026 when we wrote that vision and and frankly, we're marching right down that um, right down that path. And uh, I have a high degree of confidence that we're going to achieve everything that was written in the, in that vision at this point. So that's a pretty good start. So extending that by seven years, I think. Look, the business has to be big. We've done a great job of aligning what our impact objectives are with our financial objectives. And what I mean is, every time you buy a shoe, you're doing something fantastic for my business, and you're also doing something fantastic for the world. And if we can take that model and extend it and scale it very large, um, we're going to be really important. Uh, within that importance and that cultural relevance will come uh, great business success. And and those two things are, are very mutually aligned and uh, propel one another. And, and that alignment of our business model uh, means that I want this brand to be enormous and I want it to capture the multi-generational opportunity that it, that it has, um, as a result of, of an amazing, uh, team of people who, who worked really hard with sharp focus, uh, particularly in the early years of the business. And that's all I can think about. And it's got to have wonderful financials and we have to stay true to our values while we do it so that, um, that the, that, 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 uh, that model stays tightly aligned. Joey, listen, I can't believe it's been like six years since our last show. Thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you for putting up with my slightly prying questions. Been, uh, been great to do it. And I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I've learned a lot. Um, not sure if I've shared too many nuggets of wisdom today, but um, that journey is, is both difficult, uh, but incredibly rewarding. And with a future as bright as I believe it to be, it keeps me incredibly motivated and I hope, uh, I hope some people are learning about Allbirds for the first time today with your show and give us a shot.